Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, and welcome to Mantra Magistra, a radio show dedicated to exploring and studying the catechism of the Catholic Church, um, the marvelous document that Pope St. John Paul II uh, had had uh, written uh, at the the prompting of the many uh, cardinals and bishops who really saw the need and experienced a, a genuine need for uh, a catechism, a, a compendium of all church of all essential church teaching on faith and morality in one. Uh, in one document. Um, it really was first expressed as a, now you'll hear some noise in the background, I ask you for your forgiveness in the, uh, in the process. This is a, a show that is en route, literally, and so it's actually pr- sort of appropriate given that the, the radio show is, uh, the, is the on-air wing of en route media, so being en route, I guess, would be a very proper thing <laughs> for this show, but um, as I was saying, the um, Catechism of the Catholic Church was an idea that um, kind of came into the minds of many of the bishops and cardinals who uh, Pope John Paul II had convened uh, for a discussion of, of how to best and further implement the uh, the, the document, the Second Vatican II uh, conciliar documents, post-conciliar documents, Lumen Gentium, Gaudium et Spes, Dei Verbum, and Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, it was a major goal of the pontificate of Pope John Paul II to uh, integrate and to implement the uh, conciliar documents and the teachings of the Second Vatican Council into the into the uh, life of the church during his pontificate. Um, and today we're going to be picking up on a theme that is pretty much still at the very beginning of the catechism. And uh, that theme is a theme uh, regarding the uh, the very beginning of uh, the very beginnings of um, the process by which God reveals himself to humanity, a process that we refer to as divine revelation. Divine revelation really is the process of God revealing himself to human persons. And it's a marvelous uh, reality. Divine revelation takes place in two ways. Um, uh, We have two sources of divine revelation. Uh, One of those sources is sacred scripture. The other source is sacred tradition. And um, today's uh, show really is going to delve into um, the issue of divine revelation and these, this twinfold source of divine revelation as sacred scripture and sacred tradition. It's also going to delve into uh, that in some further detail. So let me grab my catechism. Here it is right here. And I'm going to make my way to my office as we go upstairs. And let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, 
who did instruct the hearts of thy faithful people by the Holy Spirit. Grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your favor. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, last week we spoke about um, the various, we, we, we began the profession of faith uh, in chapter 1 of um, part 1, the profession of faith, uh, which was entitled Man's Capacity for God. And we talked about the, how the desire for God is written on every human heart, that everyone is born with a heart, with a, with a God-shaped hole, as it were, in their hearts. And we all desire, if you were to ask anyone, what is it that you desire? Even if they were to say money or, or uh, fame or popularity or any number of things that people desire, really they desire those things because those things bring happiness. And at the heart of all of our desires, really, in, in, in all truth, is a desire for happiness. And it's not just as, and clearly, obviously, if we had to choose between imperfect, uh, limited happiness uh, as opposed to perfect, unlimited happiness, we would certainly, no doubt, uh, uh, choose perfect, unlimited happiness. That is truly the desire at the heart of every human person. So every one of our desires, all the various and sundry desires that we as human beings possess, arise out of this most fundamental desire that each and every one of us has for happiness. And I also brought out last week how C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, uh, begins his book by explaining that every human being, uh, for every human desire that we have as human beings, whether it is a desire for food, uh, whether it is a desire for intimacy, uh, with uh, whether it is a desire, uh, a, a biological desire, a psychological desire, a, every type of desire that we can possibly experience as humans, for every one of those desires, there exists a corresponding object that satisfies that desire. And that is true for every, every conceivable thing you can possibly think of. Uh, and so, if that is true for, if I desire to quench my thirst, and water exists, if, it, if I desire uh, to sink my teeth into a nice bloody red steak, well, that, that bloody red steak, it, it exists. Uh, and if it doesn't, I can just uh, hunt, hunt a cow down and, uh, and, um, and you know, cut my own steak. But, but for every desire that we have as humans, there exists a corresponding objective good uh, that satisfies that desire. And if that is true for every single thing, would not that also be true uh, of the greatest all-consuming longing of the human heart, which is that desire for perfect, unlimited happiness? What is, what is, what is happiness? What is happiness consistent? Happiness consists in the possession of a good. And... So it would logically follow from that that perfect happiness consists in the possession of a perfect good. And the only perfect good 
that any of us could ever conceive of would have to be God. He would have to be necessarily the perfect good. And he would necessarily have to be the creature to, who he's the only being who could, who could in fact satisfy the deepest longing that we all experience for perfect, unadulterated happiness. Now we got into the desire for God and we talked about some of the things that can block our desire for God, our pursuit of God, or our desire to establish a relationship with God. And we specifically spoke about the problem of evil. And the problem of evil is a very uh, complex argument uh, used, well, it's actually not that complex, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, um, but it can be very difficult to answer. It's very complex uh, in terms of answering the, this, this, this problem, particularly when it is posed by uh, persons who really want to give it to the, the Christian or, or, or any theist for that matter, a theist being somebody who believes in God, um, especially if they believe in an all-good, all-powerful uh, God, uh, omnibenevolent omnipotent God. If God is all good, he wouldn't want to have anything to do with, with evil, seemingly. If he were all powerful, he would certainly have the power and ability to eradicate it. And so if it is true that God exists and, he, and that he exists as an all powerful and all good being, how is it that uh, this, this God of Christianity and evil seem to uh, uh, coexist? And, and so it, it would seem at first that, that evil uh, deals quite a blow to the existence of, of an all-good, all-powerful God. But we explained, we went through, and we asked five questions last week. Um, and and my, my goal was to show that if we could adequately answer these five questions, um, that we would be able to uh, formulate an answer to the problem of evil and show how it is that God can exist alongside the reality of evil. And those five questions were, what is God in his essence? Uh, uh, or actually, yeah, I'm sorry, what is evil in its, in its essence? Uh, and uh, the, the second question was, um, uh, what is the origin of evil? And thirdly, uh, what is the philosophical solution? And fourthly, what is the practical solution? And fifthly, how does evil stand in relation to the divine will of God? And we explained that to the first question, uh, uh, what is evil? Um, uh, evil is a privation. It's the lack of something that ought to be present, namely goodness, uh, um, uh, moral rectitude, uh, virtue, um, in the case of moral evil, in the case of physical evil, what's lacking is harmony, integration. Uh, what is the origin of evil? The origin of evil is man's free will. Uh, God has given us freedom of will so that we might choose for the sake of the authentic, that which is authentically good and perfective of our human nature. God created us to be in a relationship with him, to be in a relationship of love with him. And that presupposes not only freedom of will, but also the gift of intellect. So the, 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 tw the two gifts, the two rational faculties of intellect and will, uh, to choose something, you would need to understand what that thing is that you're choosing. So, so freedom of will and intellect really go hand in hand. Uh, intellect shows freedom of will what its choices are, and then freedom of will acts based on what the intellect has uh, exposed it to. Um, so we are given this tremendous gift of freedom of will so that we might freely and meritoriously choose for the sake of the good, the good God uh, and, and choose to enter into a loving relationship with him and ultimately to enter into a covenant relationship with him, uh, a covenant that, is, that has the, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, at its heart. Uh, our Lord assumed a, a true human nature and, and allowed himself to, to be crucified and 
went through the most appallingly uh, awful death and, and shed his precious blood so profusely, his blood became the price of our salvation. And so um, that actually is also the, the um, I, 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 that's an answer to the question, what is the practical solution to the problem of evil? Uh, there's the philosophical solution, which is um, uh, basically if God, uh, could God have created a world full of significantly free creatures who, could God have created human beings who could not help but to choose the good at all times and in all situations? Of course he could have, but that would have been pretty boring and persons would not have merited eternal life. Um, God wants us to be in a genuine relationship with him. God, If God wanted uh, a bunch of computers uh, to do his bidding, he would have simply created computers. And, and But he created human beings. And human beings created computers. And it's kind of ironic how we so often refer to our, we, we're, we're, we're the ones who created this, this artificial intelligence, and yet we turn it around and, 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 and kind of think of ourselves as artificially intelligent as well and expect AI to surpass us, which is absolutely impossible if you have any comprehension of what it means to be a human being, you will realize that there's no possible way that uh, computers will ever surpass human beings. Uh, they will never become conscious. No matter how conscious they may seem to be, it is purely a, it's a seeming consciousness. It's not a true consciousness. And no matter how much power you have, uh, in, in, uh, no matter how much computational power one has, computers can literally never, ever, ever become self-aware. That's simply an impossibility. Anyway, let's get to what our discussion will be today. So we discussed, we answered our five questions, how the, um, that the problem of evil, which is a source of, 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 great difficulty for so many people. Uh, we basically, if you, if, you, if you didn't listen to last week's show and you're listening to this week's show for the first time and you'd like to go over, uh, just I, I, the, all the shows are logged. You can listen to any of the shows that have been aired and they're all logged. You can just go to, um, just scroll down on the main page of WCATradio.com uh, under the, the Listen Now, and you'll see a whole list of, beginning with Sunday, uh, Sunday through Saturday, there's a list of days, and for every, under each day of the week, there's a list of shows, and under Monday's show, you will find my show, which is Mater at Magistra, a guided tour of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, the last, or the, the most recent show, uh, aside from this one, or before this one, rather, uh, will be the show on, um, basically, uh, the profession of faith and uh, arguments against uh, evil as being a threat to, to God's goodness and or power. Now we start off today in paragraph 30. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Although man can forget God or reject him, he never ceases to, to call every man to seek him. Let's see. Although man can forget God or reject him, God never ceases to call every man to seek himself so as to find life and happiness. But this search for God demands of every man every effort of intellect, a sound will, an upright heart, as well as the witness of others who teach him to seek God. And then we have a quotation from St. Augustine who states, You are great, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power, and your wisdom is without measure. And man, so small, a part of your creation, wants to praise you. This man, 
though clothed with morality, I'm sorry, with, though clothed with mortality and bearing the evidence of sin and the proof that you withstand the proud, despite everything, man, though but a small part of your creation, wants to praise you. You yourself encourage him to delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That last sentence, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you, is one of the most famous uh, expressions, uh, one of the most frequently quoted uh, theological statements, and that is from St. Augustine, the brilliant uh, church father um, who, who actually went through many stages of, of, of uh, belief in his own life. He himself was a convert to the faith, um, and it, was, it, is, it is believed that through the, through the powerful intercession of his mother, Monica, who also is a saint, uh, who had been praying for her son, Augustine, um, that he eventually did uh, become, not, not just become a, a, a Catholic, but became a priest and ultimately a bishop. Uh, and uh, he became uh, one of the most, one of the, one of the greatest of the great saints, uh, one of the very first church, among the first of the church fathers, uh, just uh, wrote prolifically. He wrote the, the Mystical City of God, um, or I'm sorry, not the, he wrote The City of God, a uh, marvelous uh, masterpiece. He wrote uh, The Confessions, uh, which, which was basically an autobiography of his own life, but which was chock full, it is chock full of marvelous, marvelous insight. Um, two of his two of his greater greater works. Now we um, moving into section two, on paragraph thirty one we read, created in God's image and called to know and love Him, the person who seeks God discovers certain ways of coming to know Him. These are also called proofs for the, for the existence of God, not in the sense of proofs in the natural sciences, but rather in the sense of converging and convincing arguments, which allow us to attain certainty about the truth. These ways of approaching God from creation have a twofold point of departure. The physical world is one, and the human person is the second. Um, and chapter 32 states, the world, starting from movement, becoming, contingency, and the world's order and beauty, one can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and the end or goal of the universe. So God is simultaneously the origin and the goal of our entire lives and he is also the origin and the goal of the entire universe. Um, and then there is a quotation from, uh, I'm not quite sure where this, I think this quotation is from Romans. Uh, as St. Paul says of the Gentiles, yes, as St. Paul says of the Gentiles, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that he in the things that have been made. And this is taken from Romans 1, 19 through 20, cited from Acts 14, 15. Um, uh, chapter 17, verses 27 through 28, and Wisdom, chapter 13, 1 through 9. I'm just looking at the, um, the references at the bottom of the page. And then St. Augustine issues this challenge. Question the beauty of the earth. Question the beauty of the sea. Question the beauty of the air, distending and diffusing itself. Question the beauty of the sky. Question all these realities. All respond, quote, see, we are beautiful, unquote. Their beauty is a projection, and this is from 
uh, or confessio. These beauties are subject to change. Who made them, if not the beautiful one, who is all beautiful, who is not subject to change? So that is the first, um, the, 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 basically the world. Uh, now, what the, what the catechism is stating here, let's take a moment to go over this. I'll just reread that section. Um, created in God's image and called to know and love him, the person who seeks God discovers certain ways of coming to know him. These are also called proofs for the existence of God, not in the sense of proofs in the natural sciences, but rather in the sense of converging and convincing arguments which allow us to attain certainty about the truth. These ways of approaching God from creation have a twofold po point of departure, the physical world, or the cosmos, and the human person. Now, there are indeed many, many arguments for God's existence. And uh, this is something that I really, uh, really just love. I love the arguments for God's existence. Uh, this is something that falls under the heading of apologetics. Uh, what do we mean by apologetics? Are we apologizing for what we believe in? No, of course not, not in any way, shape, or form. The word apology, as it was used in the ancient Greek, is, is uh, basically synonymous with giving a defense uh, for why you, or giving an explanation of what you believe, or, or providing a defense for what you believe. So you are, we are providing, uh, when we study apologetics, at the college level, uh, if we're studying theology, we are studying the various arguments that um, are used to, to show uh, that God's existence uh, can be proven uh, reasonably uh, uh, via logic. Um, and when, we, when we talk about proofs for God's existence, we're not talking about scientific proof. We are talking about philosophical proof. We are talking about logical proof. Um, a logical proof is... Now, logical proofs are... Uh, they're not scientific, but it's so important that we understand that in our, in our world, we have... Th this notion of scientism, where people put an almost religious faith in science, as if science were the end-all, be-all, and the and, and the only means of human, the only way to come to uh, knowledge of anything, which is absolutely ludicrous. Um, can science prove that your mother loves you? Can science prove that? Um, uh, that that uh, George Washington was the first president of the United States. There are so many ways. There are so many different types of knowledge. And in fact, there is an entire sub-discipline in the... If, if one goes on to study philosophy uh, at a four-year university uh, and decides to major in philosophy, he or she will, be, will, will have to take the course epistemology. What is epistemology? It's a kind of a scary word to a lot of people. What is epistemology? I, I, I signed up to take it before I even knew what it was. Epistemology is the study of human knowing, and it is specifically the study of how specifically human beings come to know anything at all. Um, uh, exa examples of epistemology, ep uh, a little bit tongue-tied there, examples of epistemological questions might be, to what extent can I know anything with certitude? Now, that is a very common uh, question that is a relatively new question that came along within, the, within recent history. I shouldn't say recent history. Immanuel Kant. I'm sure many listeners have heard of uh, Immanuel Kant. Well, Kant kind of brought about this Copernican revolution in the history of philosophy. Up until Immanuel Kant, uh, it was kind of a given. It was a given that human beings had a genuine contact with reality, that what you saw and what you heard and tasted and smelled, and that, that your senses were providing you with, with, with real information about the world that was actually out there. And, and there is every reason 
to believe uh, in uh, and this 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 form of philosophy is called or this 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 branch of epistemology or this uh, school, if you will, of epistemology is realism. It's the idea that that it is possible for us to really be in contact with the world as it truly does exist. And uh, this was not a question for the ancients. So you will not, if you go back and read Aristotle or Socrates, or not, obviously Socrates didn't write anything down, but Plato or, or Aristotle or um, any of the early, uh, you know, any of the church fathers, St. Thomas Aquinas, the question of skepticism, um, the question of, of being able to make contact with reality or the extent to which the human mind is capable of making contact with reality, that was, simply was not a question. It was a given that you could make contact with reality. But Immanuel Kant wrote this big, big book and and it's it's kind of it's kind of ironic and it's and there's tremendous self inconsistency because here he is writing this book for an audience that he is not he he can't be sure exists because basically uh, Immanuel Kant's argument is that well you know it's not really possible for human beings to break outside of the the solipsistic, the solipsistic bubble of our minds that we're all kind of trapped in our own minds. And there's not any real way that I can know that, that you exist or that this wall exists or that this chair exists or, or that my body even exists. I mean, this could be a really grand hallucination. Actually, it really starts with Descartes. Descartes is, the, is considered the father of modern, uh, the father of modern philosophy, and Descartes, uh, he kind of he introduces this mind-body dualism into the history of philosophy, and that's really where this uh, this separation gets its start, and Immanuel Kant kind of takes it to its logical extreme, uh, where you know it becomes impossible to. Uh, it's really interesting, but the, the, the thing is, you have all these philosophers who nowadays, uh, they accept this, this notion of skepticism, and they believe that it is not possible for the human person to really know or be certain of anything. And, um, but you can ask them. So, they, so you can get a, a professor who gets up on gets up on the, uh, in front of the podium and says, it is not possible for the human person to know anything whatsoever with certainty, and I have written a 3,000-page book on precisely how and why this is. And then you can raise your hand and say, well, excuse me, professor, I have a question. Yes, sir, what is your question? Okay, well, if, it, if you have proven that it is not possible for any human person to be certain about anything, how can you be certain of that? How can you, moreover, how can you be certain that you're lecturing to an audience right now and that I'm posing this question to you? Moreover, if you are so certain that we cannot be certain of anything whatsoever, why would you spend three years sabbatical writing a book to prove to people that you're not sure exist, that you're, that, not, that, why would someone waste their time writing a book to convince people who they're not sure even exist that they can't be sure that things exist. It makes no sense. Skepticism is the biggest joke going. It makes no sense. It, there is, skepticism is rife with, with, with self-inconsistency and, and self-contradiction. If you claim that it is impossible for the human person to know anything with, with any level of certitude, and are you claiming that to be true? Because if you are, then you've negated your proposition right there. If you say it is impossible to know whether or not the human person can know anything, you're claiming that to be true. So how can you, how can you even speak 
So the, 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 the very act of communication is called into question when a person starts questioning the most fundamental rudiments of skepticism, uh, or the, fun, the most fundamental rudiments of epistemology, the most fundamental rudiments of, of the human person's ability to make contact with reality. And to call that into question, uh, really, it, 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 it's so easy, it is so incredibly easy to show a skeptic how ridiculous his argument is. So that's, that's very important to point out because oftentimes in, our, in the many efforts to debunk um, St. Thomas Aquinas' arguments for God's existence, uh, somebody will just simply come out and say, well, there's really no need to do all this because there's no way that we can prove that, we're, that, we, that we can know anything with certainty. And some, someone invariably throws in that, the, 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 skeptic, the, the problem of skepticism, if you will. But um, if we let, so I wanted to address the issue of skepticism to begin with, to show how ridiculous it is. Um, and now let's move on to the arguments for God's existence. Now, there are some uh, wonderful arguments for God's existence. And one of them, um, well, I, I, like to, I like to group them according to the cosmological arguments for God's existence, uh, which basically can be, you can think of the cosmological argument for existence uh, as ar an, an, an argument or a number of different types of arguments that, um, that use the universe or hence the cosmos, hence the word cosmological, they use the cosmos or the universe as the point of departure, um, just as it states in the catechism. There's also, uh, there are also arguments, uh, there's the, the teleological argument for God's existence, which is uh, another way of, uh, we'll get into that as well. Uh, there is the argument from uh, let's see, there's an argument from conscience, uh, there's the argument from history, there is the, uh, lo the argument from, let's see, well, there's just so many wonderful arguments. But we'll begin with the cosmological argument. Now, basically, this is a very simple, intuitive argument for God's existence. If there is an effect, there must be a cause. Moreover, an effect cannot be greater than its cause. That is a philosophical axiom. We know that no effect can be greater than its cause. It just, it's, it, that is an axiom, uh, a law of... of uh, I, I see my mother is attempting to call in right now. If she has the station on, I, I encourage her to... To, to not to hang up the phone, <laughs> but anyway, um, going to begin with uh, this. Um, uh, it, if my mother is listening to the station, if she can call into the station, uh, that would be great. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so these cosmological arguments. What is the purpose for? this, um, what is the purpose of uh, the cosmological argument? To prove that God exists. It is not a scientific argument. It is a logical argument. And it is an effective logical argument. And it is uh, an argument that explains that every effect must have a cause. Um, and that, that's just a philosophical truth. Now, now, the world and everything around us, you and I, we are all effects. And we, we come from our parents. I come from my parents, my two parents. My two parents brought me into existence or, or procreated with God 
and, and God used them to bring me into existence. And their parents, so, so, so actually Aristotle talked about the, if you, if you really want to understand something metaphysically, um, you really ought to be able to answer uh, the f- four questions about any, any given thing. Um, what, is the, um, what is the efficient cause? What is the, let's see, what are the, the four causes, he calls them. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the formal cause, the efficient cause, the, I, I forget exactly what they are, but anyway, to make a long story short, um, what, it, what exactly, what, what immediately precedes um, um, me? My parents immediately precede me. And now you can take my, both my parents, you can ask, well, what immediately preceded my mother? Her parents. Um, and what immediately preceded my, my father? His parents. And so, you know, you can just go back and back and back and back and back. Now, the question can be asked, can you go back infinitely, ad infinitum? Uh, so you have here, uh, this would be called an infinite regress, where you would just continue to stretch back infinitely with no first cause. You just keep going back, and every, every, everything has a cause uh, has every 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 individual thing has an immediate proximate cause. So my immediate proximate cause would be my parents. Their immediate proximate causes would be their parents, and this stretches back in time for infinity. Which would, and again, this is called an infinite regress, with no first cause. And some people say, well, that that's that that's how it could have been. Well, and, and, and so they, and they challenge us and say, well, how can, how can you know that that's not the case? Well, I could say to that person, okay, well, you've got this infinite regress where you're explaining each and every individual thing by looking to the thing that immediately precedes it. But you're ultimately not asking, you're, you're not, you're providing, you, this, this, Infinite regress. Uh, you can take any individual, any individual link in a chain, and explain the suspension of that link by the link that's before it. But ultimately, you cannot explain the ultimate suspension of that chain in the first place. So you can explain each and every proximate thing by the thing that immediately precedes it, but having a proximate explanation for each and every thing does not provide us with an ultimate explanation as to the, as to the existence of the entire chain of things that exist. And if there is no first cause itself uncaused that is not caused by anything else, that is not dependent upon anything else, if there is no first cause, then the entire chain of things would, see, would cease to exist. There would, nothing would exist in the first place. But things do exist. I exist. My parents exist. Therefore, there must be a first cause of all things that has absolutely no explanation other than itself, that has no cause other than itself, that is dependent upon nothing other than itself. And this is the first cause uncaused. And this is what we refer to or whom we refer to as God. This is, that is one, the, the, one of the first Ways now. This is a um, one of the myriad ways of approaching the argument of uh, the first cause argument. Some call it. Some call it the cosmological argument. Um, that's just one of the arguments. 
Now I'll move into the teleological argument for God's existence, um, which is also called the argument from design. Um, say you have, uh, basically, if you want to break it down into its, into its most basic form, um, you can say simply um, that wherever we see design, we acknowledge the existence of a designer. That's the, that's the major premise. The minor premise is that there does indeed exist universal design. There is design throughout the universe. That is the minor premise. The conclusion, therefore, is that there must be a universal designer. Um, now, it's a very simple and intuitive argument, right? How can, we, how can we dismantle that one? Well, actually, pretty easily. We could say, we could call into question the very first major premise and ask ourselves, well, why do we have to accept that, that whenever we see design, there must be a designer, an intelligent designer? Cannot there be, are, are there not many examples of, of design that are simply the result of, of chance, if you will? And I will grant that there, there have been throughout the history of humanity, throughout the history of history, um, there have indeed been situations where I'm sure uh, design has, has sprung from from chaos, as it were. But this whole concept of the argument of design, really, it, it can be taken to uh, a level where we really start to, we really start to suspect that there must be some type of really super intelligent being that exists uh, in order to, in order for there to be life on, on the planet Earth, in order for the hemoglobin molecule to have evolved, in order for carbon, which is necessary for the existence of all life, in order for carbon to have come into existence, Everything had to be just the way it was in the evolution of the entire universe, in the creation of the entire universe. And, and as I've stated in previous shows, the Catholic Church has no problem with uh, the theory of evolution, provided that we believe that at some point, along the, the evolutionary way, that God does insert an, an, an immortal human soul into that biological entity. That at the moment of conception, uh, a soul, is an, an immortal human soul is created by God at that very moment. And from that point forward, Every human person contains uh, every. I'm sorry, every human. Every human person uh, is 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 also and necessarily a spiritual being. He, every human person is a body soul composite. Uh, who is uh, the human being becomes, as it were, the 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 meeting point uh, between the worlds of matter and spirit. Um, the human person is almost the priest of creation in that in his very person he reconciles matter and spirit. He's the only being to do so, um, or the first being to do so. Uh, so, so that's, uh, again, the, the human person kind of a, uh, kind of a, a type of Christ in that Christ uh, unites the, 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 the human nature to his divine nature in order to elevate human nature. Um, so too, the, well, in, in kind of in a, 
anticipatory fashion, the human person uh, unites in his person uh, the material world and the spiritual world and thereby elevates uh, the, the, the world of matter and bequeaths upon it this, this new, amazing, the, the, we become the interface between the world of matter and spirit. Um, but uh, getting off, uh, getting off track here. I, getting back, I should say, getting back to the teleological argument for God's existence. The question could be: Well, why is it necessary that we believe that whenever there is design, there must be a designer? Well, imagine. Imagine being told, and now again, this is all, this is all Peter Kreeft. Um, so if, if, if you like what you hear, if you like these analogies, this, I, I am like a walking billboard for Peter Kreeft because the man is such a genius and he's come up with such beautiful, and, and this is all freely, readily available on the internet, by the way. This is from a talk that he gave that was then made into a book. How often does a talk turn into a book? Uh, it's usually the other way around, but with Peter Kreeft, the uh, man is such a genius that it, it, his, his talks are turned into books. So um, yes, he, uh, Peter Kreeft is probably the closest thing to Socrates that we'll ever have on, on, uh, in, our, in our day and age. But um, uh, this, this marvelous uh, idea that uh, would you be willing, okay, say back Back in the days when computers were actually controlled by computer cards, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but a long time ago, even before floppy disks, even before floppy disks, they used to have these cardboard cards, and they simply had holes that were punched in them. They weren't exactly holes as much as they were like little square punches. And they, you would feed them into the computer, and the computer would be able to read uh, these computer cards based on ex precisely where the holes were located, et cetera, et cetera. Now, say back in the 60s or 70s when you were, say you're flying an airplane from point A to point B, and you find out that the plane is being flown on autopilot. And you're like, yeah, that's fine. That's great. But then you find out they're using this, this uh, you know, they're using the computer cards that they used to use back in the day with these, with these like square and rectangular hole or, or punches. Uh, and, 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 and you say, well, you know, it's, I mean, that's, that's how they do it, so that, that's fine. But then you find out that the computer cards that are flying the plane on, on autopilot were created by a bunch of, a bunch of uh, college football students just running around wearing cleats on all these computer cards. And that's, that's basically the, uh, how these computer cards came into existence. That they, they received their, 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 their puncture marks from, a, from a football players playing a game of football and leaving cleat marks in these, <laughs> uh, the, the whole idea that if, if you leave a hundred or if you leave a thousand monkeys, put a thousand monkeys in front of a thousand typewriters for a thousand years, and eventually you might possibly get the entire script of Hamlet uh, typed out by one of the monkeys. It, the chances are, what are the chances? They're crazy. And this, this whole idea that, you know, the fact that there is life at all, the fact that you and I are alive, the fact that you exist, not just the fact that there's life, not just the fact that, that the carbon molecule responsible for all of life came into existence, not just the fact that the hemoglobin molecule responsible for the... Not, not just these individual things, but the, the fact that you exist. And here's an especially strong version of this argument that wherever there is design, there must be a designer. Um, 
if if there is no it, it, okay if if we want to challenge the idea that wherever there is design there must be a designer if we want to disprove that then we rely on the we would have to say that the human brain itself is the product of chance the human brain is the product of chance and evolution and that there is absolutely no intelligence whatsoever behind the human brain yet we rely on the human brain to know everything that we know we rely on the human brain to try to work out these arguments to determine whether or not our brains should be trusted so I think that right there the fact that we trust our brains and I, I, I had a human person who does not trust his own brain um, although you know I, I have I, I know that there are people with with serious mental illnesses out there but but that, that that's 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 the whole point it would take someone with a very serious mental illness to believe that they had no control over their thoughts and to not trust their own thoughts it would be a paranoid schizophrenic who would not trust his own thoughts so are we willing to call ourselves paranoid schizophrenics because essentially that's what we would be if we chose not to accept the, the validity of the information that our brain provides to us so that is a very that to me that's an especially strong version of the argument for uh, the argument for God's existence based on the based on wherever there is design there must be a designer there does exist design throughout the universe therefore there must be a universal designer um, that's the teleological model another argument for God's existence um, is the one I brought up uh, very early on in the show um, the the argument from desire you have all these things we have as human beings we have all these desires and for every single desire we have there exists a corresponding thing a corresponding good to satiate and satisfy that desire um, that it very suspiciously leads us to the belief that well if it's true that there is a corresponding desire for every, a corresponding good for every desire that we have then if the greatest desire of our hearts is perfect happiness there must be a corresponding good that provides that infinite perfect happiness and that good could only be God um, there is the argument from conscience every one of us has that that still small voice of conscience in our in our minds and our hearts wherever you want to locate it that and, and there is a certain self-evident truth that ca it cannot be argued there are certain things that are just so fundamental and so basic that they simply cannot be argued the reality that or I should say the proposition do good at all costs and avoid evil at all costs is what we would refer to as a self-evident proposition this is not something that we can arrive at through argumentation this is simply something that everybody or at least the overwhelming majority of human persons experience in their heart of hearts people simply know that they ought to do the good they ought to do the good 
and they ought to avoid the evil. It's, it's just a, it's a given. And St. Thomas Aquinas would refer to that as a self-evident truth. So we don't need to argue to establish that because it is prima facie. It, it is self-evident. Now, that said, we all may know that we ought to do good as often as we possibly can and ought to avoid evil as often as we possibly can, but we might have some differences on what is evil and what is good, what constitutes the evil and what constitutes the good. And yes, there may be some slight variations as you move from one culture to another culture. Uh, and so you do have some different ideas about what, but with these generally speaking, these, 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 these modifications, these, these slight variations on, on what is considered to be a good as opposed to what is considered to be an evil, by and large, are pretty ubiquitous and pretty much, they're pretty much universal when it comes to certain things, like, like for instance, the murder of an innocent human being. The, the murder, murder by definition, is the, is the killing of an innocent human being who did nothing wrong to merit or to warrant the, the uh, to warrant death, to, to warrant being put to death. Um, now, this, this issue of, of putting an innocent, you know, of take, taking the life of an innocent human being, this is pretty much, it, it is pretty much widely accepted in virtually every single culture and almost by all persons, with the possible exception of sociopaths and psychopaths, that human life and human dignity are, are, are goods that are such goods that, that it is an abhorrent evil to, to deprive an innocent individual of his most fundamental right to life his most fundamental right to live his life and to not be snuffed out, to not be killed for no reason. And that is why, as you move from court to court, from nation to nation, around the world, murder is considered a capital, a capital crime, a grave crime. It's the, one of the worst crimes you can possibly commit. Uh, and, and really, if you look at all of the, I mean, prior to, prior to, say, the third millennium, or prior to the second half of the 20th century, even better, prior to the second half of the 20th century, you could pretty much go anywhere in the entire world visit any nation on the planet and pretty much be in agreement with any random person that you came across regarding the morality of certain acts and the immorality of certain other acts. And there was almost a blanket consensus. And this was the case for this this had been this was the case from the very beginning of the history of humanity. Right up until the middle of the 20th century. So for all of human history, up until the 1950s and up until the 1960s, everybody pretty much agreed on what was evil and what, what constituted the evil and what was good and what constituted good, what the good was and what the evil was. It wasn't until the 60s came along and we had this, for the first time in human history, one of the greatest, the greatest nation in the world decided to conduct this 
moral experiment whereby human persons would allow themselves to indulge their most hedonistic desires. And it was a kind of a percolating result of the psychological state of affairs that, that was brought into existence through Sigmund Freud. Uh, it was a combination of, I think, a lot of things that were happening at that time that ultimately there was this, this, this crisis, and this culture crisis, and it led to the, literally, a complete breakdown in the moral condition of the United States of America. Uh, but that's, that's again, that, this is really getting off the subject. My point was to discuss the arguments for God's existence. And um, I did show you the cosmological. I did show you the teleological. I did explain to you the argument from desire. And there is an argument from conscience. But it's, and it was, it's easy to get off on this tangent because the times we're living in are so so, so horrific in terms of uh, people's understanding of morality. Uh, people are willing to throw the most fundamental moral axioms out the window. And it's, it's really a crazy, crazy time. But once upon a time, there was a belief that, but just, just even still, this, this argument, despite all of the chaos of our culture, despite all of the chaos, you can still use this argument. And this argument is the argument from conscience to, to sort of prove logically God's existence. And the idea, and it goes like this. If, well, let's begin with, we have all of these, um, these ideas about what's right and what's wrong, uh, certain moral axioms, uh, you know, this is, you know, this, these set of actions are all good actions. These actions are all, you know, evil actions. And, and um, granted, you do have to take into consideration the, uh, the official church teaching on, on, on Christian moral, uh, Christian morality is that, um, you know, every, for every, in order to in order to commit a, a serious sin, the 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 act itself has to be grave matter. Um, the person has to have full knowledge of what they're doing, and has to, and and the person also must have a full consent of their will when they are doing what it, whatever it is that they're doing. So uh, three the, those are the three criteria. Uh, that that must be met in order for a person to commit a grave sin. Uh, the, the the behavior or the action in and of itself has to be uh, gravely disordered and contrary to the moral order. Gravely. Uh, secondly, the person has to know that what they're doing is gravely immoral. And thirdly, the person has to have full consent of their will. Uh, now, so essentially, there could be impediments. Uh, so things that would mitigate or, or uh, lessen the culpability or the responsibility of a person would be, for instance, uh, things that would mitigate full knowledge would be ignorance. Um, if someone was, were ignorant uh, about a particular sin, about a particular action, if a person did not know that a particular act was gravely sinful, then that person would not be responsible for committing a mortal sin. Um, and uh, even even amongst ignorance, there's there there are different different types of ignorance. For example, the the most exonerating of all the types of ignorance is what we refer to as invincible ignorance. Invincible ignorance is the word we use to refer to ignorance uh, that is so deep that the person has no idea 
it, it's it's something. It, it is possible to know that you don't know something, uh, but there are cases where you don't know that you don't know something. And in the case in, in in the case of the latter, where you don't know that you don't know something, this is what invincible ignorance is. You don't even realize that you don't realize that this is wrong. Um, however, there may be cases where people do realize, or, or I should say, are aware of their ignorance, and they may intentionally go out of their way to avoid finding out whether or not a certain action or behavior is considered sinful by the church simply because they enjoy whatever it is that they're doing, and they're afraid that if they find out that it's evil, that they're going to have to work on giving it up. Uh, in that case, um, if it turns out that that action is evil, uh, uh, then that's they're, they're, not only are they committing the sin, uh, but they're also, that becomes a sin of, of, of double malice in the sense that they're taking, they're, they're taking extra steps. They're going out of their way to not uh, learn what the proper course of action is. And so they are actually uh, uh, doubling their malice, as it were. Um, and, and so that is, that is uh, not uh, sufficient to exculpate someone. <laughs> um, where when it comes to matters of the will, uh, the impediments to acting with full consent of the will would, would be, uh, and the, the catechism lists them as, as habit, um, fear, extreme emotion, and external coercion. Those are all uh, threats, or, or those are all impediments to acting with full consent of the will. Clearly, if, if, if someone's telling you to do something and they've got a gun to your head, that is going to significantly uh, exonerate you and 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 decrease your responsibility for the actions that you commit. Um, fear of uh, if someone is loses their job, say, um, a job is a a very employment is a a very very serious matter in that if you are not if, if an individual is not employed. Uh, they don't have the, the 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 ability to pay for their housing or their food or their family or so uh, that can be an incredibly frightening scenario when someone loses their job and um, especially if a person is prone to anxiety um, it could be people have taken their lives. Um, when, 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 uh, you know, if 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 there are sufficient um, stressors in a person's life, uh, some people don't know what to do, and they feel so overwhelmed that uh, they could do something as drastic as to put an end to their life, thinking that that that's the only conceivable way of dealing with a situation. Uh, to, to, to us, it may be uh, a crazy, off-the-wall thing, but you never know what's going on inside the mind of another human being. And it could very well be that, that persons who are prone to depression and prone to negative thinking do tend to have a very black and white Thinking, they tend to think in very, in very um, uh, all-or-nothing terms. Uh, either they're perfect at what they do, or they're a complete, you know, they're a complete bum. Uh, either, either, either I'm the perfect father, or, or I, I, I should just give up custody of my child. Um, the, 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 there, there, there do tend to be certain. Uh, hallmarks, uh, different types of personalities that are more prone to thinking in these absolute types of ways. And this type, these types of uh, individuals who fall into these patterns can be more prone than the average person to, uh, to doing you know, things that 
you and I would consider to be very, very, very extreme. Um, but that, again, is the, uh, the very unfortunate situation of individuals who suffer with the, the horror of, of, of mental illness. Um, uh, so, yeah, but we have, uh, but getting back to this argument, um, let's uh, just take a brief look at the time here. Oh, I've gone 15 minutes over my allotted time already. I, I, I might as well make this an hour and a half show. Another argument for God's existence is uh, the argument from conscience. Now, people say, well, this, this conscience, uh, according to Freud, according to Freud, uh, your conscience is nothing more than what your parents tell you to do and what, the, you, know, what uh, you see other people doing. Um, and uh, Freud would say, well, you know, uh, uh, when you are... Uh, a young child, you see certain behaviors, uh, you, you, you say, your parents say, no, 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 that is very bad, and, and uh, you get a slap in the hand, you get a spank, uh, and, and so you know that certain behaviors are, are going to result in punishment, and certain other behaviors are going to result in praise and adoration, you know, adulation, and you will be commended for doing certain things, and and so this whole, this is what Freud refers to as introjection, that we, that we as human beings, as we are being socialized throughout our childhood years, introject um, the mores, the social mores, and the social norms and expectations of society and of our parents and of our primary caregivers. Um, and, and really, uh, from Freud's perspective, conscience becomes nothing more than just another instinct. Well, that's a problem because we are willing to repress all sorts of instincts when we know that they're not ultimately in our own best interest. For instance... When that bell goes off in the morning, uh, when you're about to go to work the next day, and, um, and your alarm clock goes off, you may be so dead tired, and, you know, and we, we thank God for the snooze button. You, know, you, you set your clock about 20 minutes early, and then you can hit snooze maybe two or three times, and, and it, it gives you a, this, this sense that you're, you're, you're able to give yourself a little, a little bit more sleep, and it's, it's just a, you're just tricking yourself, but, but uh, yeah, this is the old snooze button, but we are willing to uh, get up when the alarm goes off, because we know that we can't be late for work. If we're late for work, we're going to get written up, and if you get written up enough times, you're going to get fired, and if you get fired, you're probably going to have a really difficult time getting another job because you got fired from the previous job you were at. So there are a lot of things uh, that motivate us to overcome our biological instinctual drives. Uh, the, the instinctual drive to sleep through our alarm clock or to just, to just take the, 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 the clock itself and throw it across the room and unplug it, we don't do that because... We know the consequences would so far outweigh the benefits of a few extra minutes or hours or whatever the case may be of sleep. Uh, we are willing to fight that desire to sleep, that desire to throw the alarm clock across the window, uh, across the room rather. Uh, and so so there, there, there might be times when we're at work and we're tempted Say we could be in, just so amazingly tired. Say we pull. Say say, you know, the, uh, uh, your wife just had a baby. Um, the baby kept you up uh, most of the night. You got about two or three hours of sleep at the most, if you're lucky. And you are exhausted. So not only was it incredibly difficult to wake up with that alarm clock going off, but it's incredibly difficult to. Stay awake while you're at work, and yet, and, and you you want nothing more than to turn your your workspace into a bed 
<laughs> and so you want to just curl up and and take that little that little pillow that you have and then put it and just take a nap right underneath your desk. But you would never do that because you know, again, you, you get written up and then you get written up enough times, you get fired. You get fired. You can't find another job because you're fired from your last job. And, and if, you don't, if you don't have a job, you can't pay the bills. And it's just it's a sequence of events that becomes so overwhelmingly difficult to deal with that you know you're not going to do it. <clears throat> so my point is we are constantly repressing our instincts. We're constantly repressing and suppressing our instinctual biological drives to sleep, to eat. You could be starving. You could be famished. And you could walk into a restaurant and you smell the food wafting in from the kitchen. And you could follow the smell into the kitchen and see this beautiful steak, this ribeye steak, sitting on the to-go, waiting for the, you know, the cook has just cooked this beautiful ribeye steak and these, these garnished garlic mashed potatoes. And it's just, it looks so delicious. Your mouth is watering. Now, you, you're obviously not going to take the plate and start eating because that dish belongs to another person at the restaurant. And it would be crazy. You'd, you'd be barred from that restaurant for life if you did that. Uh, not to mention probably jailed uh, for, for uh, breaking the peace or, or whatever it is. Uh, so there are all sorts of things that we just don't do because they are not. We are human beings and we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Now, if we are to ask ourselves, well, what, what, is, what is this conscience that we have, this, this thing that tells us we should do certain things and we should not do certain other things? Well, some people will say it's just another instinct. Well, if it's just another instinct, why is it so hard to dismiss it? I mean, we are constantly dismissing the instincts to oversleep, the instinct to sleep during uh, a party or to sleep during our time at work uh, or, to, or to, uh, grab, to take food off of another person's plate and start eating it. We, we constantly deny ourselves all sorts of instinctual drives because we know that if we did those things, we would be thought of as maniacal. But the, 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 the very thing that teaches us, you know, this is good and this is not good, this is clearly not an instinct. Because if it were an instinct, it would be just as easy to repress that instinct as we do any other instinct. There would be times when we're simultaneously tired and hungry and we've got all these things going on and yet... We stay for three extra hours at work to get a project done because we know we have to get it done and we are suppressing three different biological instincts simultaneously. So clearly, okay, so, so then what is conscience then? If conscience is not an instinct, is it, well, some, some people will say, well, it's, it's Conscience is the result of a, of a group of people who have agreed upon what is socially acceptable. Well, what's the difference between one person telling you what is socially acceptable and a group of persons telling you what is socially acceptable? Um, if, you know, we ultimately we all follow our own codes um, that we have formulated for ourselves. And um, we really don't care what other people do. Uh, we might even say that they're, we might look at another person and say, wow, they have a really crappy code. Uh, a really, you know, they, 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 they live by a really crappy code. Um, and we're, we're basically judging 
their code of conduct. And we're saying to ourselves, that's not, they, they don't hold themselves to a very high standard. And, and we're saying, you know, they ought to, and so is that a judgment? Well, that's a whole other, that's a whole separate issue, but we are, we, we are passing a judgment about the person's code of conduct. And, uh, and we say, well, well I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't do that or allow my children to do those things or yada, yada, yada. And so you are reinforcing your own beliefs about your code of conduct. Um, so, I mean, we really aren't all that impressed with the codes of conduct of other people unless we admire the code of conduct of another person so much or that we see another person living according to such a high code of conduct that we wish to emulate them. That is the only time we will question our own code of conduct. When someone else is living to, according to a higher standard and we feel convicted to raise our own code of conduct, that is such a fascinating experience. What could that be? Is that, is that just enough, is that an instinct? Is that, is that, is that socialization? No. This, there's something far greater at work here. This is conscience. This is the voice of God in the human soul. And God uses various people and puts people in our path to show us various different ways of living that are according to a much higher standard than the one we hold ourselves to. He uses other people and their high codes of conduct to convict us and to show us that we're not living up to our full potential as human persons. This is something far beyond instinct. It's far beyond socialization. And the only explanation for conscience is the existence of a higher power, the existence of a being who is the perfection of the code of conduct, a being who habitually, who, who, who in and of himself is the good, who always does the good. And if we look to Jesus Christ, I mean, granted, this is, there's quite a leap from our arguments for God's existence and, and belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior of humanity. However, if we just take a moment and we we're going to make that leap and say, well, let's look at Jesus Christ. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the way. The, the, he, he is the code of conduct. He in and of himself is the code of conduct. He's the truth about that code of conduct. He's the truth uh, about everything we believe in our faith. So he is the creed. He is the code. He's the way, the truth, and he is the life. How do we receive divine life? We re there are two ways we receive divine life. Prayer and the sacraments are the two vehicles of grace. Grace is a participation in the very divine life of God. Um, but these are the, there are many arguments for God's existence and the church teaches that it is entirely possible for the human person to understand completely and fully uh, that God exists through the natural light of human reason, that it is not necessary that God reveal his existence for us to know that he exists. However, God does reveal his existence, and his existence is, in fact, a part of the overall divine revelation uh, because God wants to ensure that we will indeed, uh, if, not, not everybody has the capacity 
to work through these, these philosophical arguments for God's existence. Not everybody has the time to, to study these arguments for God's existence. Being able to study these things is a luxury. It's a true luxury. And being able, being able to take the time to, to study anything is, is, is really the result of a very, is the mark, the hallmark of a, of a very advanced civilization. Um, leisure is the foundation for education. Um, the fact that we don't need to put 100% of the people to work 100% of the time and that we're able to take blocks of time and set them aside for educational purposes, that is the hallmark of an advanced society. And leisure is the foundation for uh, advanced civilization. On that note, we will return next week with another show. I thank you so much for listening. Uh, I ask you to pardon all the times that I went off track, but um, uh, hopefully every show will be better than the one uh, that came before it. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.